In 1821, eight years after the death of James McGill, a royal charter founded McGill College. For the purpose of education and the advancement of learning. From a handful of students, McGill grew into a community of hundreds of thousands of people united across the world. Je crois fermement aux qualités uniques de l'intelligence humaine. As we celebrate two centuries, we look back and we look forward. We are inspired by those who came before us. The dreamers, the innovators, the people who just wouldn't give up. Democracy is not an escalator going up. Democracy is a perpetual struggle. And we will learn from our history. So that we can work to make a fairer world. A better world. We know that by work, all things increase and grow. Today, as they've done for 200 years, the people of McGill continue to make their mark on society. In Montreal, across Quebec, Canada, and the globe. And we are not stopping there. The world faces new challenges. But we will find answers. Qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait faire, chacun de nous, si on veut laisser à nos enfants une planète qui est en meilleure condition? We have our eyes on the future. A better future. Full of promise for all. A future made by McGill. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping things before we get started. The judges, please, can you uh, switch off your uh, microphones and your cameras unless you are uh, speaking? I'd like to remind you that you're being uh, videoed, so uh, that's that out of the way. So welcome, everybody, and he hello, and welcome to the fourth uh, Clinical Innovation Competition. I'm Jake Barrelet, Director of the Innovation uh, at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences and the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning at McGill. Au nom de l'Université McGill et la Faculté de Médecine et des Sciences de la Santé, bienvenue à tous. This, welcome to the fourth annual McGill Clinical Innovation Competition Finals, or as we call it, the second year of pitching in the final edition, or as I like to call it, the best 4% of McGill's history so far. The McGill Clinical Innovation Competition was the vision of our founding donor, Dr. Raymond Hakim, and it aims to provide medical innovators with a network of support, to arm them with the resources and knowledge and to connect them with experienced leaders in the industry and with clinicians to help mentor them and develop promising ideas into real solutions that will have a direct impact on patient health. Before we uh, get going, I'd like to uh, take a few moments to acknowledge why we're here, thank the participants, the partners, and our supporters. First of all, I'd really like to thank the teams who took the time to submit a proposal to this year's competition. We received many excellent submissions that uh, address a wide range of health concerns, and sadly, only five teams can be in the final today. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our extraordinary panel of judges from academia and industry, in particular the external judges who have taken time out from their busy work schedules to join us today. And they've been involved with the, the judging process going down from dozens to a final 10 to a final five. Um, thank you very much for being with us today and especially to the judges that are here live in the panel today to pick the, the best of the best. And thank you for raising this competition to the high standard that it now has. This year, our applicants were offered a series of preparatory workshops to help aim to uh, elevate the quality of their business planning. We gave them training on the, the fundamentals of business planning, intellectual property and regulatory affairs. I'd like to take a second to thank Bearskin and Par, District 3 and Lock North America for leading these workshops. We're also grateful to someone very special in the, in the university, Mr. Andrew Churchill from McGill's Teaching and Learning Services, known to everyone else as the Pitch Whisperer. 
He's given us excellent pitch preparation, and you'll be able to see later the uh, benefits of his incredible preparation as you watch the finalists later this evening. I have to thank the generous uh, support of our sponsors um, for this year's event. Novo, Faskin, the Steinberg Center for Simulation in, in, in Interactive Learning, the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship, and you'll hear a little bit more about them later on. And of utmost importance, I'd like to thank the generosity of the people behind each of the prizes today for their vision, inspiration, and commitment to clinical innovation. Dr. Raymond Hakim, creator of the Hakim Family Innovation Prize and inspiration for this entire event. Madame Marika Selenka Roy, in partnership with the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. Dr. Don Shepard from the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative in Infection and Immunity, otherwise known as MI4, supported by the Dogon Foundation. Carmela De Luca, partner at Bear Skin and Par, supporting the new prize in the best trainee-led clinical innovation prize. I'd like to hand you over now to uh, Dean Eidelman, Vice Principal of Health Affairs and Dean for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Um, it's great to uh, celebrate our innovative thinkers during this special bicentennial edition of McGill's Click. <clears throat> Innovation in medicine is, is really ingrained in McGill's long history, uh, really ever since uh, uh, the university was established. We are the first faculty in the university and the first faculty of medicine in Canada. We were established in 1829, as you know, in collaboration with the Montreal General Hospital, the MUHC, uh, and it's great that the Montreal General Foundation continues to support this event. But over the centuries, we've seen the training of generations of healthcare professionals, scientists, and really uh, we brought together some of the world's most talented students, residents, teachers, and research. And it's, it's worthwhile, I think, reflecting on some of the examples of innovation of the McGill community uh, that contribute to all sorts of breakthroughs in medicine and healthcare. People like Sir William Osler, uh, whose innovations were in medical education, who began his medical uh, teaching uh, career here in Montreal after graduating from McGill, uh, and before going on to, uh, to Penn, uh, Hopkins, and eventually to Oxford. Sir Thomas George Roddick, uh, you can see behind me in my uh, graphic that Roddick Gates named after him. He was a McGill-trained uh, physician and surgeon who ever, forever changed the practice of surgery. As an early adopter of germ theory, he learned of the new uh, antiseptic technique of Joseph Lister, introducing it here in Montreal and reducing surgical uh, complication rates from 80% uh, to less than 4%. Nora Livingston established what would go on to become a renowned training uh, school for nurses, which is now the Ingram School of Nursing, and whose curriculum was uh, innovatively uh, composed of scientific as well as practical courses. Um, uh, this was at a time when there were very few uh, formal schools of nursing in the world. Over at the neuro, Brenda Milner, uh, who is still an active uh, member of our faculty, is uh, known internationally for pioneering research into the human brain and is uh, considered to be one of the founders of the fields of clinical neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience. And of course, uh, people who will be aware of uh, Phil Gould and Samuel Friedman's uh, discovery of carcinoembryonic antigen, the first biomarker for cancer. Uh, which is still being used as a blood test and represents an area of active research today. And I would add, uh, there are members of the judges panel, as well as the speakers who themselves have made a significant contributions and are great innovators at all levels. Um, as we celebrate the many accomplishments of the past, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge that there are always new challenges to address. Modern technology, global connectivity offer both exciting new uh, possibilities to see creative solutions, but also all kinds of new challenges and problems. And the faculty is committed to supporting innovators to develop their ideas into actionable outcomes that will improve the health of patients, their improve the quality of life for their families, and improve a society at large. We have the potential to make a tremendous impact with the right vision and supports in place. And today's clinical innovation competition is a testament to what we can accomplish together. Now, in regard, it's my pleasure to present our next speaker, who's a perfect reflection of innovation at McGill. Dr. Gerald Freed 
He's the Associate Dean of Education Technology and Innovation and Director of the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. He's a general surgeon. He's uh, had a very distinguished uh, uh, period. Uh, he just finished uh, about a year ago as chair of surgery. And he's, has, uh, he's internationally known both for his uh, work on advancing minimally invasive surgical therapies and especially for his innovative work in education for which he's been uh, recognized uh, really uh, globally. And Dr. Fried will launch the event and give you a brief, brief overview of what to expect. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Eidelman, and good evening to all. It really gives me great pleasure to witness the growing innovation community, both here at McGill and throughout Quebec. So let me give you an idea of what's to come. We'll begin with the awarding of the Bearskin and Par Innovation Prize for the best innovation led by a trainee team. This will be followed by the awarding of the first and second place MI4 Innovation Prizes. We will then hear five teams pitch their innovative ideas as they compete for the Marika Zelenka Roy Innovation Prize and the Hakeem Family Innovation Prize. They've been selected from about 30 outstanding proposals at the tip of the iceberg. After that, the judges will deliberate privately to choose the winning teams. And during this del these deliberations, we are very fortunate to have three special guests who will speak to us today about innovation. Monsieur Paul Larchevet is the Director of Innovation at the Ministère en Santé et Services Sociaux au Québec, and he'll talk about the innovation strategy in the province of Quebec. Mr. Noam Krantz is Vice President of Venture Investments at J&J &J Innovation, and he will speak about the importance of collaboration between industry and universities. We will then hear from Dr. David Benremo, Chief Scientific Officer at AFRID Health, a winning team at the inaugural Click event in 2018. But first, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Raymond Hakim, the inspiration for today's competition. Dr. Hakim is adjunct professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. He received a Master of Science degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, then a PhD in engineering from MIT, and worked in Montreal as a research engineer for Hydro-Quebec. After that, he attended medical school at McGill and performed his, uh, his residency in internal medicine at the Royal Victoria Hospital. He then did a renal fellowship at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. From 1980 to 1987, he served on the faculty of Harvard University as associate professor of medicine and attending nephrologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. In 1995, Dr. Akeem was one of the founders and the chief medical officer of the Renal Care Group, a provider of outpatient dialysis services with excellent patient outcomes. The group merged with uh, Fresenius Medical Care in 2007, and Dr. Hakeem became the chief medical officer, serving in that role from 2008 to 2012. I don't know how he found the time, but during all this, he's published more than 200 papers on clinical and basic research related to chronic kidney disease, dialysis, and plasmapheresis, and has contributed more than 35 chapters to medical books. Dr. Hakeem is the recipient of numerous awards, including being listed among the best doctors in America and Americans, America's top physicians for multiple years. He received the, medical, the Medal of Excellence from the American Association of Kidney Patients uh, and the prestigious Belding H. Scribner Award in 2017. In addition to the Hakeem Family Prize for Clinical Innovation in Healthcare, which we're celebrating today, Dr. Hakeem also funded the Catherine McLaughlin Hakeem Chair in Medicine, and more recently, the Hakeem Family Bursary for newly arrived immigrants and refugees entering or enrolled in a health sciences degree program at McGill University. Dr. Hakeem. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Fried, Dean Eidelman, and Dr. Barrelet for these introductions. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Diana Lynn Wiedner for the amazing work she has done to organize this event and make it happen during these difficult and restrictive pandemic times. 
I'm so appreciative of all the work that went into this fourth year of the McGill Clinical Innovation Competition. But just to put things into perspective, this is also the 200th anniversary of McGill. So happy anniversary to all. J'aimerais aussi dire quelques mots en français puisque je suis Québécois et Canadien. Bienvenue à tous et mes remerciements à M. Paul Lachevêque pour sa présence à cette occasion pour célébrer l'innovation en santé à McGill, surtout pendant l'année bicentenaire à McGill. Ce concours encourage les Megillois et j'espère bientôt tous les Québécois à élaborer et développer des projets prometteurs qui, nous espérons, auront des retombées directes et positives sur le soin de santé au Québec, au Canada et partout ailleurs dans le monde. This idea of funding and supporting the development of clinical innovations at McGill Department of Medicine and Health Sciences came to me a few years ago when in the process of recruiting some key executives for a company I used to work for, I Googled a few startup healthcare companies in the US to find out the background of the key executives of these innovative companies. Somewhat to my surprise, many of these key executives of these US healthcare companies had trained or got their education in Canada, and quite a few had trained at McGill. I was able to personally connect with a few of them, and in almost all cases, they readily admitted that the idea behind the innovative solutions they came up with that helped them establish these companies in the US came to them while they were studying in Canada or McGill. But they could not find a way of developing or funding their ideas while they were in Canada because they did not know how to translate their ideas into a commercial entity. They did not know how to patent their idea, how to connect with venture capital funds to help them develop their ideas into practical commercially viable entities. So after discussions with Dean Eidelman and Jake Baralat, my family and I decided to fund these annual competitions of innovative ideas in healthcare at McGill. And with the great and much appreciated help of Jake Baralat, we were able not just to select the best innovation ideas, but also to help the winners transition from the innovative idea to devices or compare or com, compa, sorry companies that help patients achieve better health. So thank you, Jake, for all your contribution to these outcomes. And as you will hear from a couple of previous Click winners about their continued success. This program is really helping develop these ideas, and I very much appreciate everybody's help in making that happen. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Marika Zelenka Roy for agreeing to fund two additional innovative ideas with the Marika Zelenka Roy prizes. As I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth year of this competition, and every year we receive more than 40 applications. And one of the toughest jobs for me has been to be one of the judges to pick a winner from among so many great applications. As I read each proposal assigned to me, my reaction is, wow, that is a great idea. But eventually I have to decide with the participation of the other judges, which application will receive one of the prizes. So for all those applicants who submitted a proposal but will not be awarded one of the prizes, I would say keep working on it. Because as my dad always reminded me, quote, you can always do better, end of quote. And especially when it comes to healthcare, we should always try to do better for the patients entrusted to our care. And as Diane Wiedner reminded me, initial failures, initial failures often prove to be opportunities for future growth and success. 
So good luck to the five finalists and we wish the best to all applicants. And thank you for all the judges for taking the time to join this program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hakeem. I'm pleased now to introduce Carmela DeLuca to present the Bear Skin and Par Innovation Prize for the best trainee-led innovation. Ms. DeLuca is a partner with the legal firm Bear Skin and Par and a member of its executive committee. She's a lawyer and registered patent agent in Canada and the United States and practices in all areas of intellectual property. And she's been an enormous help to us in this competition, as well as to the entrepreneurs that you'll be hearing from today. Carmela? Thank you, Dr. Freed. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you here today and for Breskin and Parr to have the opportunity to be involved. Uh, having been involved for a few years, I've been very impressed with the uh, the caliber of the participants. And uh, I really want to congratulate the organizing team and all of the sponsors. It's truly a great event and, I'm, and we're very happy to be involved. Uh, Breskin and Parr is an IP firm. We do IP. Um, I have the privilege of working with a lot of scientists and engineers who are also trained in the language and the understanding of IP so that we can help uh, entrepreneurs and startups um, really get value for their IP. So we're very happy to be involved in this event. Um, um, we have people on the patent side, trademark side, um, at industrial designs. And so we, we can really uh, help people with their intellectual property. And so today we're very excited to be able to award the Breskin Par Innovation Prize um, that as uh, Jake and Dr. Freed have mentioned is for the best trainee led uh, clinical innovation and the uh, innovation that really has promised to develop uh, into something competitive. We're very uh, excited to congratulate uh, Neuromedical uh, who I understand is also a finalist uh, in today's presentation. And so we will be hearing uh, from them uh, more later. So I look forward to hearing the presentation. Congratulations. Thank you, Carmela. Um, next, uh, we will introduce Dr. Don Shepard, the uh, head of MI4, who will present the first and second place MI4 Innovation Prizes. Dr. Shepard is a professor and chair of the McGill University Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and the founding director of the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative in Infection and Immunity, also known as MI4. Dr. Shepard. Thanks very much, Dr. Freed. So for those of you that are wondering what that incredibly jaw-breaking name, uh, which is of course why we call it MI4 actually is. So this is an attempt to tap into the innovative spirit and expertise across the McGill ecosystem to address uh, the global threats in the infectious and immune space. And I don't think I have to convince anybody as to the importance of infectious diseases in this era or in this era of vaccination, the importance of uh, the immune system in dealing with those threats. So MI4 actually brings together over 200 research groups from across all of McGill's campuses, teaching hospitals and units. And together, we have actually managed to raise, since uh, MI4 was founded in 2018, over $30 million in philanthropic and leverage funding in support of over what will be, after we announce today's winners, over 120 research projects, platforms and programs. So we're very proud to participate with uh, Click in this competition. Innovation is the lifeblood of success and it's what we believe in firmly. So we've put our money where our mouth is and we are sponsoring the MI4 prizes for the best solution to an infectious or immune, re immune related disease. There's two winners here. There's a, a first prize and a second prize. The first prize receives an $8,000 monetary award. The second prize gets a $4,000 monetary award, but both of them receive um, what I believe is about $14,000 worth of support from the Click ecosystem, including physical presence at the Click platform and access to faculty and university services in support of moving their innovation forward. So with all of that said, let's go straight to the announcing the winners. And these winners need to be congratulated not only on having won this prize, but both having the most cool names out of the pile of the uh, applications we reviewed. So the uh, second place winning team I'm going to uh, reveal is Sensor Real. And I believe we have a video of that, do we? Hello, everyone. 
My name is Bruce Berry, and I'm part of the team who has built the first blood test that was ever done in space. In collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency, we have built a chip that can measure up to five protein biomarkers using only a finger prick of blood. In May 2019, our work was successfully commissioned by astronaut David Sanjak at the International Space Station. Since then, we've been working on the commercialization of our technology for an application here on Earth, where we became intrigued by a seemingly easy but extremely important problem, the antimicrobial resistance. We want to answer the question whether an infection is viral or a bacterial. The existing tools, such as RT-PCR, are slow, and it takes at least 48 hours to get a bacterial culture done. They are limited, and it's hard to collect samples such as sputum samples and they, they suffer from high rate of false positives. As a result, doctors have no choice but to overprescribe antibiotics. We want to change that. Luckily, we have the most intelligent diagnostic tool, which is our own immune system and the biomarkers within our own blood. Using only a few drops of blood from the finger, the biomarkers such as CRP and PCT and our IP protected technology, which consists of our chip and state-of-the-art AI techniques, we can differentiate bacterial and viral infections with over 90% sensitivity and specificity all within 15 minutes. Our beach, uh, our beachhead market are the COPD patients who have fragile lungs and frequent exacerbations. We want to differentiate but not only bacterial and viral infections, but also be able to catch exacerbations early on and reduce the risk of hospitalization. Furthermore, we want to do real-time monitoring and discontinue antibiotics when it's appropriate. We will be the first diagnostic tool for management of antibiotics for COPD patients. We are tackling a huge market, which represents 5 to 10% of the population. With over $5 billion in market size and 43 million patients in North America alone. Over the past six months, we've been working with Health Canada, where we have customized our platform for four biomarkers to differentiate bacterial and viral infections. We are kicking off a validation study of our biomarkers over the summer to study more than 200 COPD patient samples, and we plan to do further product improvement and uh, clinical validation to obtain the regulatory approval by 2022 and launch into the market shortly after. While we have grants and contracts in place for the next two years, we want to accelerate our growth. And that's why we are aiming to raise three to five million by the end of the summer. We are also actively looking for physicians and clinicians who might be interested in working with us. Thank you everyone, we are Sensorio and we are building the future of diagnostics. Thank you very much for that presentation. And once again, congratulations to the entire Sensorial team for their success and the MI4 prize. Now moving on to the first place winning team. And again, uh, a team with a superb name. It's my great pleasure to announce that Elephant is the winner of the first place for the MI4 prize. And I'm certain we have a video about to play for them as well. Here at Elephant Medical, we are reimagining rapid diagnosis and are leveraging advances in machine learning technology in order to provide patients with a digitally integrated testing solution. In 2018, the CDC reported over 5.6 million cases of big two non-viral STIs, otherwise known as chlamydia and gonorrhea. These diseases are particularly hard to contain as they often go unnoticed. In fact, up to 65% of people who contract them are asymptomatic. This contributes to STIs being a major burden on the US healthcare system, with total direct medical costs in 2018 totaling $16 billion. Companies such as Everlywell make $100 million plus in annual revenue, trying to address this problem through send-in testing services. In their business model, patients order a kit online, collect their sample at home, mail it to a remote testing facility, and receive their results by phone a few days later. And that's all well and good, but wouldn't it be wonderful if instead the results could be communicated in a matter of minutes without having to mail your private biological data? Elephant Medical is accomplishing exactly that with our flagship product, The Compact. This digitally integrated rapid diagnostic solution to the detection of big two STIs combines proprietary biorecognition technology with state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms to provide our patients with convenient, reliable, inexpensive, and private testing in the comfort of their own homes. The advantages of this disposable platform are threefold. First, the test results are automatically and intuitively communicated to the patient on their smart device via Bluetooth. Second, we can connect the patient to telemedicine services to deliver end-to-end -end care at the point of need. 
And lastly, thanks to our embedded sensing technology, the Compact already has a five times greater sensitivity than traditional tests. As for timeline, Elephant incorporated federally in Canada in early 2019. Since then, we've been working diligently to develop our benchtop prototype. And with this milestone achieved in the short term, Elephant is looking to raise funding to finalize development and manufacturing infrastructure for our first gen prototype. And V1 of the Compact will then be used in a first in human pilot study with clinical samples sourced, for, uh, sourced from a partner clinic in Montreal called Prelib, who are responsible for over a thousand STI diagnostic tests a month and are eager to work with us on product development. In the longer term, Elephant must obtain regulatory approval from the FDA and other agencies prior to marketing and distributing the Compact. Our regulatory consultants have helped us develop a strategy involving the implementation of QMS procedures for eventual ISO 13485 certification, a clinical trial in the demonstrating substantial equivalence under the class 2510K pathway, and ultimately approval under the LJC and LIR product codes, which are specific to chlamydia and gonorrhea rapid tests. The promise of our technology is beginning to generate interest across the board, demonstrated most clearly by our team recently placing six out of 450 applicants at the Rice Business Plan Competition in Texas, and along with our winning the Johnson & Johnson J-Labs Healthcare Innovation Prize. With all this in mind, Elephant is currently seeking a $1.4 million seed round in order to fund our upcoming pilot study to take our technology closer to market. Thank you very much. So if you'll permit me, before I pass the microphone back to Dr. Freed, I'd just like to congratulate both of the teams and to say that, of course, your enthusiasm and innovation is infectious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shepard. And congratulations again to the uh, MI4 um, winners. So now you'll be hearing from the five finalist uh, teams, um, Bioptic, ExmaQ, Gynaware, Neuromedical, and Remote Optical. Each team will have five minutes to pitch, followed by a five-minute uh, Q&A period for the judges to ask questions. Uh, Diane will be moderating the questions, and we ask that the judges please raise their hands on the Zoom to signal that they have a question. The teams will be competing for the following prizes. The Hakeem Family Innovation Prize, and you can see details on on the slide. And they will also be competing for the first and second place Marika Zelenka Roy Innovation Prizes, as shown on this slide. So the first team, uh, Bioptic, their presentation will be delivered by Trevor Cotter and Natasha Jacobson. I want you to remember the last time you woke up with excruciating low back pain. Maybe you couldn't bend over to put on your socks. Maybe you couldn't even get out of bed. Even if this isn't your experience, it is the reality for four in five Canadians who experience low back pain sometime in their lives. What's worse is the frustration of going for massages to the chiropractor, to the doctor, and feeling like no one can pin down what exactly is causing your pain. We are here to support physiotherapists and particularly pelvic health specialists who are working to treat low back pain. Now my business partner, Trevor Cotter, is going to go over this market in a moment, but for now, we are providing these clinicians with the tooling they need for evidence-based treatments in the form of intra-abdominal pressure measurement. Now, intra-abdominal pressure is the pressure contained in the abdominal compartment. When it reaches unhealthy levels, it can cause undue stress on our spines, resulting in that pain. Unfortunately, the existing method of measurement for this property requires the injection of fluids into your bladder by way of a catheter. Even if you have the worst pain in the world, it's still unlikely that you would sign up for this procedure. That said, BioOptic is offering an alternative solution. Our product is affordable, non-invasive, just rests on the surface of your skin, and as rapid as getting your blood pressure checked. In fact, it's kind of like a blood pressure cuff in itself, but for your abdomen. As of today, our team has submitted a PCT on the design and underlying algorithm that allow us to uniquely calculate intra-abdominal pressure. What's more, 
is that we know physiotherapists, the eventual users of our device, want science-backed solutions. Thus, we have published our design in peer-reviewed academic journals. It's important to understand intra-abdominal pressure so that physiotherapists can better target their treatment plans for low back pain. I'm gonna pass it off to Trevor now, who's going to put our product in the context of its competitive landscape. When we look at the existing devices for intra-abdominal pressure measurement, we first come to the Convitec. This is the bladder pressure measurement that Natasha mentioned earlier. It's very expensive because it needs to be done in a clinical setting. And while it does do a great job of measuring intra-abdominal pressure, its level of invasiveness makes it very difficult to adopt. The myotin that you see in the middle is about 10 times our expected cost. And while it is non-invasive, it does not actually measure intra-abdominal pressure. It measures related physiological properties. Our device measures intra-abdominal pressure non-invasively cheaper than either of these. When we look at how we want to sell this device, we want to first target a beachhead market of pelvic health physiotherapists. Through market research, we've learned that these are the physiotherapists that are interested today in measuring intra-abdominal pressure as it relates to low back pain and other conditions. From our beachhead market, we want to expand into the US, gaining about 10,000 potential users still in that pelvic health sphere. Eventually, we'll break into the general physiotherapy market, meaning that all physiotherapists can use this device to help guide their treatments. Our team has a variety of expertise setting us up for success. Our direct team members are on the left and our advisors are on the right. Among us, we founded two seven-figure medical device startups right here in Montreal. We have experience in engineering design, clinical studies, and a key opinion leader in clinical biomechanics. When we look at where we are now, where we wanna go, we have a validated technology with a provisional patent and PCT, as well as a published design. We are currently targeting the Canadian market, eventually beginning to sell in the US, before eventually developing a more user-friendly wearable device. If we think of what we have right now as a blood pressure cuff, eventually we want to make this into a Fitbit, making BioOptic the new standard in non-invasive intra-abdominal pressure measurement for the treatment of low back pain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We're now going to proceed uh, with the with the uh, question period. So I'm going to ask our judges if they have any questions um, to please raise their hands. All right. And I will call on you by name. So, uh, Michael, me, please go ahead. Awesome. Th thanks, guys. Great presentation. Um, you, you highlight how the broader physiotherapy market and um, practitioners will leverage the output of this measurement to guide clinical practice. Can you speak a little bit to how the information from this device will actually change the course of treatment versus just treating the symptoms of, of pain? Absolutely. We are not making any claims that we are a cure for low back pain. We are simply a tool for physiotherapists to come in with a patient and they check, okay, your intra-abdominal pressure, it's a little high, a little low. We're going to try and bring it to a healthy range. And there are published data uh, on healthy versus unhealthy intra-abdominal pressure uh, points at this time. And so this is just a means for physiotherapists to say, okay, no, that's not the issue. We've got to focus on something else. So it, it's definitely a guiding tool for, um, for clinicians in the future. Uh, I'll also add that it can further be done to monitor progress over time. So even if the symptoms are still there, you can see if, if someone is on the right track through their, through their treatment, through their exercises. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, can you please uh, go next with your question? Hi there. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm curious to know if there's another use for this in a medical setting with, uh, for example, ascites or something like that? Is that something you've considered? Absolutely. That's actually a really exciting future prospect for this device is going into the medical realm. We're currently focused on the wellness device uh, market in terms of physiotherapy, rehabilitation sciences, 
but eventually, and we've spoken to different clinicians who are interested in this in either the OR or in an ICU. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. for instead of the bladder pressure measurement, a nurse can quickly come in, do a uh, do a quick pump with our device and say, okay, we've got we've got something to be concerned about here, or you're doing okay. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Hakeem. Uh, you're next, please. When I read the application and listened to your presentation, one question came to mind: Have you confirmed the validity of the measurements? I know that you measure it, but what do you get? Do you have a way of linking it to a standard way to ensure that it's accurate. Thank you. That's so fundamental to the to this product. Um, we have just completed our cadaver studies as of two days ago, and we found that there is moderate um, convergent validity between our device and uh, urinary bladder pressure, as I mentioned with the catheter. Though it's moderate, there is concern to be had with cadaver usage for um, pressure measurement. So there, I, I still see moving forward doing living patient trials to further confirm our validity. But this moderate um, validity at this time is really promising. Great. Uh, okay, so our last question then, uh, go ahead, Steve Erlis. Just from a business perspective and not from a clinical or technical perspective, uh, what is the um, the potential benefit of um, of your device um, versus the current gold standard that could justify some kind of a a business model that could be interesting to uh, potential investors? Obviously, you'll need money to uh, develop this product. So, what is the, the the economic benefit to your technology versus what exists today? Currently, physiotherapists, I'm going to speak to the rehabilitation market. Currently, physiotherapists, rehabilitation clinicians cannot have catheters be placed in their clinics. So there is absolutely no intra-abdominal pressure measurement to date in their clinics. What we want to do is provide uh, those tools. We're not sure, and this is where we could use some, some marketing business advice in the future, is if it's uh, one payment for the device or perhaps a subscription type of usage where you have an app associated with it to monitor your patient's uh, outcomes. But the bigger picture beyond that is reducing low back pain rates and improving um, return to work uh, times. So that's more of a larger economic benefit, but from a business standpoint, it's the direct uh, sales of our device to the clinics. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, so we're now going to move on to the second team, which is Eczema Q. And Charlie Bouchard and Valerie Jack will be presenting on behalf of Eczema Q. My name is Dr. Carolyn Jack. I'm a dermatologist and immunologist, and I'm co-founder of Eczema Q. I'm the doctor of last resort for patients with atopic dermatitis, commonly known as eczema. Eczema Q, our software as a medical device, provides remote access to care, personalized medicine, and empowers patients with shared decision making and self management. I'm the director of operation and co founder of Eczema Q. Throughout my life, I've struggled with unbearable inch and intense flares of disease. In 2018, I was hospitalized at St. Mary's after presenting to the ER with infected open sores all over my body. I had spent weeks where I couldn't sleep, I couldn't shower, I couldn't focus on school. It felt like my skin was on fire. As a last resort, I was referred to Dr. Jack and that encounter changed my life. And since then, we've been working closely together to develop a tool to help other patients like me because I'm not alone suffering and these patients also deserve support to manage their disease. In fact, atopic dermatitis is the most common. It's the most burdensome skin disorder worldwide. It affects five to 10% of adults in developed countries. It comes with an astronomical cost, uh, both to individuals and to healthcare systems, uh, estimated at almost $4 billion in the United States annually. We know that that cost is uh, for individuals nearly doubled uh, for patients who have uncontrolled disease. And so why is it so hard and why is innovation needed? 
To start with, there's no diagnostic test. It's a completely unstable disease. It's constantly changing. It's unpredictable. It's uh, variable in its distribution and time course. And it is something that um, can look differently in different populations. It's not just a skin disease. Patients suffer, they're stigmatized, and also it's the an open door to further sensitization to allergies, food allergies, asthma, allergic rhinitis, hay fever. Patients in their skin are petri dishes with um, overgrowth of bacteria, leading to a lot of mental health disorder, anxiety, depression, and there's restricted access to dermatologists. We have the highest number of pending consultations. 50,000 patients actively waiting in, in Quebec is very real. So someone like this may not get to see me for you know six months to a year. And when they do, a list of questions that I might have to to go through with them um, is, is really quite long. And, and essentially, this is just a section of it, you know, because I'm trying to assess just how much of the disease they've had over their life course, uh, what treatments they've failed, uh, what kind of environmental triggers they may have in their environment, how I can modify them with them, how we can look at other triggers for the disease that can be avoided and how it will change over time and how when I need to assess the, the, the disease, I need to measure it, uh, incorporating the entire body surface area uh, with validated disease severity measures. I then need to intervene with a complex um, therapy for different parts of the body and then that treatment will change over time as the disease does. And we try and optimize it. We may have to go through first, second, third, and fourth line treatments that change their immune system. I need to talk to them about all of those things and the modifiable factors and how I'm going to safely change their immune system with lots of monitoring. Patients end up lost. It's too much. They are left with questions because it all has to happen within five to 10 minutes. It's too complex and time consuming. This is really why the current standard of care has led to so much failure. This has led to a high number of patients turning to digital resources for self-management. This current market is essentially being addressed by our solution, Eczema Q, a mobile health application that is a mobile, um, that is a software acting as a medical device. Uh, we've done uh, extensive studies and, and market analyses, and we know that um, the studies show that the majority of the existing apps out there don't comply with international guidelines. They haven't been co-developed with um, experts or with patients, and they really insufficiently support that evidence-based self-management of disease. Our tool is patient guided. It answers patients' questions. It's expert validated, and it has, features a staged consent model where you can log as in a get, log in as a guest, or you can personalize the tool and uh, control the data yourself. And there's a third stage, which we have previously talked about. The content is optimized to answer patient questions in a choose your own adventure multimedia um, method. And we have a body map that allows patients to know what treatments to use when and where. And this also is associated with a diagnostic assistant. So it's essentially an intake um, data uh, form. And we can also track disease using validated disease severity measures. We can capture the disease with our photo tool and photo gallery, and it's bilingual. We know that this tool uh, can really have a tremendous impact on the suffering worldwide, that it can actually change the treatment landscape. And we will reduce the burden of in-person knowledge translation currently, gaining an efficiency for both clinicians and patients. It allows for that remote access to care and to disease measurement and capture, and this will lead to long-term reductions in costs. We have an RAB approved study already underway, iterating with healthcare providers and patients with a co-development model followed by a public launch. And um, then we follow that with an RCT where we're validating efficacy versus the current standard of care. We know this will let us through the regulatory landscape that is necessary to be licensed by Health Canada as a software as medical device. And our extensive network will allow us to optimize and maintain this model over time. We really want to make this innovative tool freely available to patients and clinicians and the wider public. And we um, want to thank our team that has really done a tremendous job with us and our stakeholders for their support. Thank you for that, that presentation, uh, Carolyn. Um, so we're now going to open the floor up to questions. So if you have a question, uh, please do raise your hand. So I'm going to start with uh, Nadine Nefari, please. Hi, thank you for working in this space. Um, I'm curious, 
so you've got an app here. Um, I work in the U.S., and so everything's got to feed into the EHR, whether it's Epic or Cerner. So I'm curious, is this multi-directional between the app and the electronic health record? And are you going to be using the images for longitudinal studies? Those are great questions. In fact, currently, due to the limitations in EHRs being so multimodal and the fact that in the digitalization of healthcare, a lot of that um, medical chart is actually moving from the physician control to the patient's hands. In this disease, we know that 99% of disease activity happens outside of the clinician's office. So this is a tool that allows patients to track and measure their own disease and allows them to export that data to themselves. They control it and they can share it with their physicians when they want to. Future iterations of the tool in the back end will allow for interfacing with that data, um, the database, in other words, can have another user interface added to it. And the professional versions of the tool will allow for that to then be matched with these EHRs. The second question you had had to do with uh, the images uh, longitudinal studies over time. Will it feed into like a data registry? Yes, this is why we have a staged consent model. So patients can use the tool without actually signing in or even you know adding any data to it if they just want to have the education. Then they can also personalize the tool. If they do log in and, and use the tool, then they will have the opportunity to reflect that data back to themselves and to share it with themselves. They can export it and share it with their doctor if they choose to. <clears throat> there's a sec there's a third uh, stage of consent in the based on a data donation model for those patients who are interested in helping researchers, industry, and um, and, and and universities um, learn more about the disease. We need a lot of information about the prevalence. We there's just a lack of, of knowledge currently in Canada and my cohort. I have more information about this disease in Canada than any other uh, site that we um, will be asking patients who do agree to specific terms and conditions that are going to be clearly outlined if they do agree to a data donation model. And that model will allow for us to use the data um, to be able to iterate further and to learn from those photos and data. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Hakeem, please go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, is there a trigger in your App, app that will have the data that the patient is registering that will transmit it to the dermatologist. So in other words, you're asking about the back end. So right now we're leaving it in the patient's hands. We're leaving it for the patient to be able to control their own data and to share it with their dermatologist if they choose to. In other words, they can push it through their email and they can email it into the clinic if they choose to. On the back end, we can adjust the user interface to have various versions of the tool. And then we have in our revenue model, a you know on the, the first step is you know we have these two different um, uh, models where we have, you know, patients who have free access to the tool, um, who are essentially using the free access with um, in-app advertising and a separated um, marketplace tab where they can navigate through to, um, you know, basically all of the creams and dermo cosmetics that you would see in the front row of your pharmacy. Um, the professional version of the tool that they would have free access to for four months to allow them with the diagnostic features and the remote management would then be um, essentially a subscription that they would uh, pay for after four months. And this is the subscription model for, for physicians um, will be a lot more sophisticated than that because we can go on the back end and optimize the user interface so that it can be matching with the EMR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry we don't have uh, time for any more questions. So we're going to move on to the next team, which is Gynaware. Uh, so Ida Durish will be presenting on behalf of Gynaware. Please go ahead, Ida. Today, I'm going to tell you about a pandemic, but this one in particular is silent since it isn't at the forefront of current news. 70% of women develop fibroids, which are benign uterine tumors that in approximately one out of four women are symptomatic, including symptoms like bleeding, intense pain, and difficulties conceiving. Now, treatments for these tumors will soon exceed $9.4 billion annually, but thankfully, the push towards minimally invasive surgeries brought about a surge in a new laparoscopic surgical uh, technique, which had a huge healthcare benefit in both costs and patient outcomes. But just as a novel minimally invasive technique was at the peak of its uh, tremendous growth, the FDA warned against its use in 2014, which resulted in a surge of preventative and invasive surgical removals of the patient's uterus as the most prevalent treatment for fibroids. So 
what happened, what caused this tremendous upheaval, which resulted in this huge setback, uh, setback and monumental shift in fibroid treatment. Well, here's Amy Reed, who doctors assumed had fibroids, so they removed them through this minimally invasive technique, but she actually had a deadly cancer called a leomyosarcoma, and the surgical technique was directly responsible for spraying these cancer cells throughout her body. And this actually brings us to this FDA warning, which is a phenomenon that translates in over 900 million additional dollars in healthcare system costs. So the reality today is that patients are subjected to longer wait times. There's a lot of uncertainty and uh, they essentially uh, have poor health outcomes. And, you know, at the end of the day, there was so much potential growth for this uh, market, but there's just no rigorous data on how to differentiate fibroids from leomyosarcoma before surgery. And that's actually where GynoWare comes in. Our team is developing the first device, which will pre-surgically take a tumor sample to diagnose, allowing doctors to offer patients personalized, cost-effective treatments, uh, whether it be by clearing women from minimally invasive options or by detecting their cancer earlier and improving their survival outcomes. And LeoGuide will essentially triage patients via diagnosis, meaning that the implementation of our technology uh, will reduce flagged uh, high-risk patients from 20,000 to 6,000 per year. It'll also reduce unnecessary surgery costs and wait times, uh, specifically uh, by decreasing open hysterectomies and OR times. And it most importantly will give patients ease of mind by improving their outcomes and allowing for more conservative treatments. And to improve the accuracy of the presurgical uh, diagnosis, we'll actually be working closely with pathologists in order to obtain representative samples, uh, which is reflective of current practices in other medical fields. Now, as for the competitive landscape, Solution providers right now focus on creating minimally invasive treatments uh, in gynecology, while we actually focus on a diagnostic biopsy. And when we compare to neighboring fields, we've actually assessed uh, that their limitations prevent them simply from capturing uh, this market specifically. And our class, uh, our class two product going to market is going to allow for a more diverse uh, treatment uh, array for women which is going to return. And these prominent uh, treatment companies will actually eventually fill a more collaborative role, uh, as well as a partnership in getting us customers and scaling our business. And no doubt we are competing at a high uh, value market with a niche entry point at $38.7 million, uh, which targets the most, uh, the, the approximately 2,500 doctors who treat the most high-risk patients. But with our tool scalability, uh, with the continu continuous use of single-use uh, biopsy systems, we actually envision capturing the $515 million market, which encompasses all North American gynecologists. And we will actually try and prove through our clinical trials uh, that our disposable biopsy systems could be used in other medical fields such as urology or gastroenterology. And our risk mitigation is that it's proven. The minimally invasive options that were uh, used before were higher in Amy Re uh, prior to 2014. And by bringing our innovative solutions, we're gonna bring a uh, true uh, uterus preserving approach. So the only women who will be getting hysterectomies are the ones who truly need it. Now, since January 2020, we've achieved many key milestones, including our cadaver test, uh, getting into a, a lot of uh, different Montreal incubators. And so far, we've amassed over $63,000 in funding and are at the cusp of filing for our provisional patent. And we require uh, help from uh, the clinical innovation competition in order to test our hardware and form a hospital collaboration. And I hope that I've convinced you that this opportunity is not only lucrative, but it will also provide the first of its kind, uh, kind sample research database for leomyosarcoma studies. Uh, thank you so much. And this is our wonderful team and I will leave the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation, uh, Gynaware. So we're gonna open up uh, the questions with our judge, uh, Dr. Dan Roden, please go ahead. I had my hand up for the other one, but I will, I'm happy to ask. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the staging of this kind of procedure. Do you do the the, the the fibroid biopsy at a separate at a separate setting, or is it the same setting? Uh, and uh, it feels like that would be the a, a limiter in terms of utility. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So we would actually integrate it within the workflow uh, pre-surgically. So right now, uh, it's very common to do endometrial biopsies uh, to detect uh, cervical cancer. So we would be implementing it in a very similar manner where our biopsy would be essentially performed uh, pre-surgically in an endoscopy suite. So we would not be requiring uh, any kind of OR time for our procedure. Yeah. 
about a day off for the patient and an anesthesia procedure? I would say, so actually, to clarify, another wonderful uh, comment is that we would actually not be using general anesthesia. We would be using a local anesthetic. So the patient would uh, get their biopsy taken and they would be ready uh, to go, uh, hopefully, very shortly. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, Jennifer Hamilton, please go ahead. Hi there. Great, great presentation. I had a question about the workflow as well. And I wasn't quite sure the way you were positioning it, whether like every patient with a potential fibroid would be tested or just those um, that were more high risk. So that was part of my question. And the other part was, given the history with the, um, the problems of the past, do you have to prove ultra safety as well? Yeah, so I'll actually, I think uh, I, I have um, our doctor Dr. Gangel on the call. So I'll actually let him answer this question since I think he has the most uh, contact with patients and I think he can provide some insight. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that the, the question about the workflow you wanted to ask the first part. Well, of the is question. it all patients with fibroids that would be would be tested? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So the, the incidence of fibroids is 70% is of women. So it's impossible <laughs> to test everybody. I know. Uh, and we have, a, you know, in our clinical experience, we do stratify the risk between very low risk, you know, somebody who's 20 who has two, three centimeter fibroids, it's very low risk versus somebody who's 50, who has a, a large increasing in size fibroid is somebody who's at very high risk, though not necessarily a sarcoma. So um, there will be some work to be done to uh, try to stratify the patients at risk. And our strategy is essentially to probably as, as a first client to start working with the oncologists who are commonly dealt with this question, is this a sarcoma or this is just a fibroid? And uh, they are very, we, we spoke with a bunch of oncologists and they're very enthusiastic about being able to differentiate these tumors in special in patients who are difficult can, uh, surgical candidates who we do not want to operate on. Uh, and based on that, maybe as we gain uh, more understanding, uh, we'd be able to stratify better. Uh, and there was a second part to your question. Um, is do you have to prove safety that it doesn't cause the issues that we're mm -hmm. we're dealing with? So now? it's a very different uh, it's a very different procedure than the one uh, that um, was, uh, that Ida mentioned. Um, this is very close to what a hysteroscopy or, or more commonly a, a colonoscopy is, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the other procedure is literally inside of your belly morselating the tumor in small pieces. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are issues, let's say with like, for an example, with the colonoscopy, there can be complications, but the complications of these procedure, overall, it's a lot less than um, the procedure that uh, caused the grave, uh, the grave complications. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, so that's it uh, for the questions and the timing is actually perfect. Uh, so it's time to introduce the next team. So we're going to head with, go ahead with Neuromedical and Jean-Gabriel Lacombe will be presenting on behalf of Neuromedical. Every year in North America, parents of 40 million children anxiously drive to the emergency department, hoping that nothing serious has happened to their children. But the sad reality today is that even if nothing is happening, there is still a one in three chance that these children are given the wrong dosage of intravenous medication. Now, for a majority of these children, it means a delay in care, but for 1.5 million children every single year, it means a life-threatening adverse effect. Hi, I'm Jean-Gabriel, co-founder and CEO at Neuro Medical, and today I want to talk about how at Neuro, we're using automation to make the hospital a safer place for children. Now, there are three reasons why we see all of these errors happening in pediatric emergencies. And the first reason is that everything in pediatric medicine depends on the weight. And as you can imagine, you can't just put a sick child on a scale. And technologies that are used today are wildly inaccurate. We're talking about 70% of these measurements are inaccurate. The second reason why we see errors happening is that everything is calculated by hand. So we have nurses with pen, paper, iPhone calculator, going through a binder full of medications, trying to get the right dosage. And the third reason why we see errors is that everything is prepared by hand as well. And it not only takes one nurse, it takes two nurses to do this together to ensure no errors are made. And so when we saw this process, it became really obvious to us that there's a need for automation here. 
And that's exactly what we've done. We've developed a device that gives time back to nurses so they can focus on their patients instead of focusing on medication. So how does that work? When a patient's brought in, all the nurses have to do is use a weight estimation device and wrap it around the upper arm of the patient. Their weight in the, is then automatically communicated with more accuracy than anything available on the market to our application. And our application not only calculates all the right dosages, but it sequences all of these medications and makes sure that no interactions are happening between all of the listed medications. Now we validated this solution with key opinion leaders across the US and Canada, and the feedback has been outstanding. But when we look at the impact that this can have in the clinic, we see that we can reduce errors by close to 50%. And now that doesn't only save lives, it also generates really important savings for these hospitals. We're talking about $1.3 million in annual savings for a level one trauma hospital. Now, as you can imagine, there is some competition in this space, and we can see some large companies operating here. But what's important to know is that a lot of these companies never design and develop their products for pediatric emergencies. And the few companies that did are wildly inaccurate. So what we've done is we've worked directly with nurses and doctors to provide a solution that's automated and that works for them. Now, in terms of business model, we have a recurring revenue model or a SaaS model with a monthly fee ranging from $1,000 a month going all the way up to $3,000 a month, depending on how many devices and depending on the size of that hospital. And by capturing 300 hospitals by year five, we are looking at a $10.1 million annual recurring revenue. Now, in order to get there, there's a lot of things to get right. But two things that are important to consider are the regulatory affairs as well as IP. In terms of regulatory affairs, we're already working with a regulatory consultant to ensure that we can file for a 510K. And that's not only going to reduce risk, it's also going to re reduce time to market for us. On the other hand, we are working on IP to make sure that we protect our innovation, and not only for pediatric uh, emergencies, for adult medicine at large as well. Now, we've already touched on some of the points that, and some of the things we need to do in the next few years, things like testing that we're uh, currently undergoing with the Montreal Children's Hospital, regulatory approval. But if we shift focus to the longer term, we can see that we're, we're working on a second generation as well as a third generation product. And the reason why we're doing this is because we've talked to doctors and nurses across the U.S. and Canada, and their feedback is that in a lot of cases, they don't know what to do when they're presented with pediatric patients. So here, we not only want to help them with the calculations, with the weight estimates, we want to help them know what medications to give next so they always get it right and that pediatric patients are always safe. Now, our team got together as part of the surgical innovation program, and we have a range of different expertise going from business to engineering to uh, the clinical research expertise, and we've been supported from day one by experts here at the Montreal Children's Hospital. So at Neuromedical, we are reducing medication errors and we're doing it by providing more accurate weight estimates. We're also doing it by making IV dilution, IV calculations easier than ever before to make sure that children that present to the hospital are always safe. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so we'll now move on to the question period. I see Robin Tamblin has a question. So please go ahead, Robin. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can you expand a bit on how you're validating the accuracy of your calculations and your weight estimations? Yeah, absolutely. So the calculations are already validated. We're using data uh, that's been used for years here in Canada. So it's, it's, it's best standard of care. And in terms of weight estimates, we're already planning uh, testing this summer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna triage pediatric patients and compare their actual weight to what our estimates are providing. And, and for the calculations the uh, for medication dose, how is yeah. that, how are you doing um, So those are just the standards. So we know what the, the standard quality of care and the standard of care should be. And we're feeding all of these, uh, these data points into our software. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Jeremy Levitt, please go ahead with your question. Thanks for that presentation. I understand that uh, the technology you're proposing has, has multiple layers to it um, and, and several different features and functions. I'm wondering if you can just help us clearly define 
uh, what your minimum viable product is and, and exactly um, what indicators you have that you're on trajectory to reaching product market fit with it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll start with the product market fit. And what we've done is we've worked directly with dozens and dozens, uh, dozens and dozens of nurses, doctors across the U.S. and Canada, people in the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, across Canada. So we have feedback from them and we're able to present our solution, and get the feedback. But we're going above that and we're, we're testing directly in simulations with Dr. Ilana Bank this summer. She's an expert here in Canada in, in pediatric simulation. So we're testing that with her. And I, I forget your first question, but I'm sorry. My first question was if you can clearly define what your minimum viable product is going to be, because there seems to be several layers to yes. it from uh, hardware to software. Yes, yes. And, and that's a really interesting point, because initially we, we wanted to, to provide more automation to doctors and nurses. But the feedback we got from them is that, you know what, if we can estimate the weight estimation part along with the calculations, that's already a huge step in the right direction. So that's, a, that's our MVP, really. It's weight estimates and the calculations and sequencing of, the, of those edges. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Brent Norton, please go ahead with your question. Just uh, again, a little bit like uh, Jennifer Hamilton's question. I don't really understand what you're measuring, and without some understanding of whether you're measuring it's certain, you know, strictly circumferential electric, uh, you know, electrical signals, I have a really tough time judging what the, you know, how e how easy it might be for someone to, uh, you know, to replicate what you're doing. Can you talk to that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and, and there, there's some information we can we can talk about and some we can't because we're, we're in the process of filing for a provisional patent by now, but we don't have it yet. But what's important to know is that this arm cuff goes around the upper arm. So really it's circumferential with other factors that estimate the weight of pediatric patients with accuracy that's, that's never been seen before in, in those types of scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, last question, please go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, just getting to uh, more on that question is what is the proprietary aspect? Is it the arm measuring, the algorithm? Is it both or a combo? <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so the arm measuring is one for pediatric and non-pediatric patients. And it's not only arm, it's, it's really limb based. Uh, okay. measurements that lead to weight estimates. And there's also uh, the, the notion of a system that goes all the way from weight estimation to dosage uh, calculations, and then eventually preparation that we're working on as well. Okay. And quick follow-up, can it be used in the developing world, do you think, in the global yes. world? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and great. it's definitely something we're looking at, yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, so we're thank now going to move on to our fifth team presentation, which will be remote optical, and the presentation will be done by Angela Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Let's start with the story. A 39-year-old was hammering a nail when it ricocheted into her eye. She rushed to the ER where the primary care physician diagnosed a scratch and treated her with antibiotic eye drops. The next morning, she had searing pain and couldn't see. She rushed to an ophthalmologist who used a slit lamp to correct the misdiagnosis, discovering her eye was punctured and she needed surgery. Patients at the ER, remote communities, senior homes, and battlefields also see a PCP or optometrist for care first. If needed, referral with ophthalmologists are made afterwards. Providers untrained in ophthalmology are unable to assess certain eye conditions, so accurate diagnoses occur only 42% of the time, whereas ophthalmologists provide 83% accuracy. Every single day, people face eye emergencies that require prompt recognition and appropriate treatment. Otherwise, they can lead to blindness in less than 24 hours. However, not all patients can get a prompt appointment with a specialist. These maps help show why. In Canada, only one ophthalmologist resides in the Canadian territories, and 29% of Canadian regions have none. In the U.S., over half the counties have low ophthalmologist availability. We at Remote Optical provide solutions for eye doctors to remotely examine, diagnose, and monitor patients with eye conditions. Patients will access our device at their nearest medical center, including general clinics, ERs, and optometry clinics. A non-technical worker will help adjust the device, and in the click of a button, the patient's eye will be imaged using novel 3D approach. This paradigm shifting innovation of a known technology captures depth and complexity required for clinical quality exams. 
Our proprietary software transforms the imaging data into stereo images of the eye that allows ophthalmologists to conduct a dynamic eye exam equivalent to the in-person slit lamp from anywhere. Our device will collect a valuable image data set, which will be the foundations of incorporating AI to our software. This will enhance the accuracy of diagnoses and improve eye health monitoring. We are defining a new standard by which the connection between primary care doctors and ophthalmologists will be revolutionized. By linking patients to remote ophthalmologists, we can dramatically increase diagnostic accuracy. So no matter what, the remote ophthalmologist will be ready to see you. Our solution results in better eye care by providing patients with immediate access to an ophthalmologist when necessary, increasing access to eye care for everyone, reducing the risk of complications, and improving the rate of correct diagnosis from 42% to 83%. The current gold standard is the slit lamp that dynamically examines the eye. However, it can't be done remotely, nor can it collect data. Our other competitors that offer remote and or asynchronous exams still use conventional imaging and video solutions that don't allow for dynamic manipulations. Remote optical has the solution for immediate and accurate care from a specialist. At first, we will sell our device at cost to gain traction amongst early adopters. Once momentum is gained, we will sell our device for $50,000 per unit. If we capture 1% of the 350,000 targetable healthcare facilities in Canada and the US, we can generate $175 million from device sales. And with global expansion, our total addressable market almost triples. In the US market alone, there are 102 million eye-related visits to primary care doctors per year. We will generate revenue through a software as a service fee at $20 per exam. And if we capture 1% of these visits, we can generate $20 million in yearly SaaS revenue in the American market alone. While building our roadmap to commercialization, we've been communicating with McGill's Office of Technology Transfer. Following quality systems, security practices, and filing our class two device for a 510K will be essential for our go-to market strategy. Our beachhead markets are Indigenous Quebec communities and rural clinics due to their dire need for increased access to eye care. Next, we'll expand to military uses, where we've already received interest from the Department of Defense. With the help of CLIC, we can fulfill this timeline by first obtaining our patents. I'm truly excited to be part of this team, consisting of Dr. Levine, an ophthalmologist, and two of my surgical innovation colleagues. We've also hired a skilled software developer and are in the process of onboarding a second. Together, we harmonize the clinical, technical, and business skills necessary to develop this revolutionary solution. We're remote optical and we bring you access to a specialist right away. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. So we have a question from Steve Arliss. Please go ahead, Steve. Yeah, um, hi. Um, great presentation. And um, I want to congratulate you on that. My, my question would be, have you considered, uh, I mean, obviously the $50,000 capital equipment cost would be a, a, a fairly significant barrier for a lot of um, places, um, perhaps compromising that and in increasing the per use revenue stream as opposed to the capital equipment cost. Have you considered that? Yeah, so that was, a, that was an option that we have considered. Uh, but this pricing model we do think uh, makes sense considering the fact that ophthalmic devices typically are sold uh, for the equipment. Plus, uh, currently there is uh, diabetic retinopathy screening that's happening in Quebec and the price for each uh, scan is approximately $20 as well and we know that it's a, a cost that RAMQ is able to absorb in that case uh, so we really do think that this model is good but we're 100% going to continue speaking to KOLs and experts in the field to continue to optimize our pricing model so that's definitely something we'll consider. Thank you. Great thank you thank you for that. Uh, Jennifer Hamilton, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I believe a slit lamp um, does more than just measure scratches or perforations of the eye. It could me measure things in the back of the eye as well. Are you focused on the front of the eye only for your technology? The first generation is focused only on the front of the eye just because that's actually the harder one to do. 
There already is okay. a technology for doing the back of the eye. It's photographs. And that's because the back of the eye is a pretty much a two-dimensional structure. Although it's folded, it's curved. Uh, but that, that mm -hmm. history and fo using photographs for diagnosis at a distance goes back years. In fact, I'm part of a team in, in the province, in Quebec, where we're implementing that across the province. The mm -hmm. hard part is the, actually the anterior segment because, okay. it's, as Good. was mentioned, it's dynamic. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Michael May, please go ahead. Following up on, on Steve's question a little bit, um, how have you thought about the serviceable population for any device? You show these maps of all different counties where you can deploy this to, but if someone needs to drive 100 kilometers to get to one of your remote sites versus 200 kilometers to get to uh, an ophthalmologist, is that really changing the picture? And like, what, what sort of density and, and size do you need? And have you taken that into consideration on your on your market ass assessment? So it's about bringing accessibility. So not only are we bringing access in terms of distance, so like, let's say a, a place cannot actually afford the device, we what we're bringing is also the access to the ophthalmologist. So, yes. But, but that's for $50,000, right, in your pricing model? And how many of those do you need to sell to actually access sort of that, that larger? Well, currently, so within Indigenous communities right now, actually bringing down patients costs between $9,000 to $30,000. And so we know that within government, uh, uh, as diabetic retinopathy, they do subsidize these kinds of programs. Uh, and then within the counties, we know that with the increase of uh, patients that they'd be able to service, they'd actually be able to make more money which would in turn pay the device. The Thank other you. part of it I could just mention is that the optometrist uh, um, percentages are higher. And so many, and there's a long history of optometrists buying, let's say visual field and OCT machines. So other equivalent equipment. And so we consider that that is very likely to take place, that that penetration should be high. And so they will also serve as a bridge between what you're discussing, the, the spread outness of the of the population with respect to putting the devices where they can be afforded. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, so we have a last question now from Jeremy Levitt. Please go ahead. Thanks for that presentation. And, and just following up on, on Michael's question, I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, help us better understand who your primary user would be, uh, as well as um, the, the portability of your product in terms of uh, uh, who can use it and where, and also what level of expertise is necessary? Absolutely, great questions. So our first uh, beachhead market is indigenous communities and rural clinics. This is because they really do need the access. And as Oliver said, the government is fully willing to reimburse the travel costs, which can be pretty significant. And so that's how we'll, we'll start. Additionally, Dr. Levine has a background launching a pilot study in these areas. So we know we have the background to be able to do this. Um, the technical training that's required to operate the device is very minimal. There, there's only going to be assistance to help the patient sit down and get positioned properly, and they just have to click a button. It's nothing more than that. And so eventually, we plan on making it um, more user friendly so that they don't need a technician at all. And on top of that, we are working on an iteration um, that's portable, uh, specifically for the military use. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all the teams that presented. Um, so now we're going to um, invite all of the judges to move into a breakout room. Um, our assistant will be helping you to do that. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Dr. Barrelet is going to uh, introduce our speakers who will be speaking to us during this uh, period while the judges are hard at work trying to choose a finalist among these amazing teams. So good luck, everyone. And go ahead, Jake. Thank you, Diane. So now we're going to have uh, three speakers uh, while the judges are, are doing their hard work. Our first speaker is Mr. Paul Larchevec. He's a director of innovation at the Bureau de l'Innovation, uh, Minister de la Santé et Services Sociaux. Uh, Mr. Paul Larchevec was appointed the first ever director of, director of innovation at Quebec's Ministry of Health and Social Services in April 2018, in line with the government's 10-year strategy for life and sciences. He holds a master's in neurophysiology from the University of Montreal and has been a key figure in many high profile developments in Canadian life sciences. He was CEO of Genome Quebec for eight years 
and has extensive experience in the private pharmaceutical sector. He was senior part partner at Cap Cogito, a consulting firm providing services for integration of innovation to the public health and social services sector. Bienvenue, Monsieur Lachebec. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's a real a pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, I, I, I want to say first that uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to the presentations and to uh, the innovations that were presented to us. Uh, I, I see innovation every day in my life and uh, every day I enjoy uh, the uh, possibilities that uh, those uh, innovations are bringing to uh, our patients, uh, users and healthcare system. So so thanks for the presentation. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir invité. Merci au Dr. Heldemann et, euh, et à tous les organisateurs euh, de, de, ce, de ce processus euh, important. Um, uh, I want to start with uh, with the last year's experience uh, with uh, COVID and uh, uh, every every pain we've been through and uh, all the difficulties we've encountered. But uh, there's been a few a few lessons that we've learned through this process, and I, I will focus tonight uh, on uh, on three of those lessons. The first one is. Uh, is uh, yes, we can be surprised. <laughs> we, yes, we something some things will happen that we've not expected, and uh, we we need to be ready for the what we're planning for, and we also need to be ready for not we're, we're not what we've been able to plan for, and th this is an important uh, factor, and uh, I want to 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 talk a little bit about that. Uh, we've also learned that um, in, in cases of a crisis, and it's not the first time we're learning that in history, but in cases of crisis, we're able to uh, mobilize ourselves and to act uh, in a very significant way to, to address an issue. Uh, and uh, most importantly, that in those kind of circumstances, we're able to change. So, so, so that that's kind of the uh, introduction to 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 the next of the the presentations, which will talk about the fact that with our healthcare systems here in Quebec, but here in Alberta, here in Ontario, here in the UK, here in everywhere you can um, turn your your uh, your mind to. We are faced with enormous uh, COVID crisis uh, pending uh, that will be coming upon to us. Whether we talk about uh, mental health, without we talk about elderly care, with you know, we, when we think about those, we've got big, big, big uh, issues that are uh, confronting us for the future, and and uh, we we need to do a better job at uh, assessing those uh, those issues and and preparing for them and 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 making sure that. Uh, we 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 have some kinds of ways by which we we are will be able to face those issues as uh, as we are faced with them and 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 the solution often is okay we'll we'll add more people we'll add more dollars we'll add more resources but it's not a never-ending game you know we cannot just continue to add add and add and and that's where we we need to start thinking differently and and maybe think about innovative ways by which we can deliver care and innovative ways by which we can uh, approach the challenges we we are faced with and and even today, when we're not faced with the full impact of those issues that I just described to you, uh, we, we've got a very hard time coping with the demand. We've got issues with access to um, first line, access to surgery, access to uh, mental health care and that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we've got issues with um, human resources. We're not, we don't have enough human resources to deliver all the care we, we want and need to deliver. And uh, we, we obviously have uh, budget issues and we'll see those in the next couple of years as uh, we will be faced with the uh, consequences of the COVID uh, crisis and uh, wh what it has uh, cost and uh, generated in terms of issues. So, so, so that's where, you know, innovative uh, tools, uh, uh, just imagine uh, taking uh, artificial intelligence and being able to deliver a diagnostic to, uh, to a particular disease and uh, using significantly less uh, nursing time to deliver that, or uh, being able to reduce the consultation time in the physician's office because uh, we've uh, we've been helping him having a better diagnosis and a better assessment of the situation, and uh, to deliver better better care. So 
I mean, those tools uh, are important for the patient, for the user. They're important for the healthcare the, uh, that is being uh, delivered by, by the healthcare professional, but they also have a tremendous impact on our ability to, uh, to uh, generate a sustainable healthcare system. So, so that, that's where that's where we we've got innovation and and one one of uh, uh, the job we need to do and that's where the reason why the innovation office was created is to try to match try to to bring uh, some links between the issues we are faced with the challenges we are faced with and we've got a hard time coping with and how to introduce, use, uh, and uh, measure the impact of innovation and see how it can help us uh, take care of those challenges. Uh, again, you know, I was uh, speaking with uh, uh, the people from the Strategic Health Work in Alberta, and they've got similar issues and similar thinking in development. Uh, and we were t- talking to uh, the UK uh, NHS and uh, the uh, people uh, of the AAC, and they've got a similar, I mean, they've got a tremendous dashboard looking at how they've been able to help resolve some uh, key uh, healthcare issues with uh, with innovation. And, and that's where we we all are kind of moving towards and we need to to work together at uh, at making that happen so <clears throat> We need to, to to understand the patient needs. We we need to 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 sometime, and it's not always the case. There's a bottom up process which is happening, which is uh, very uh, vibrant. I would say. I mean, there's tons of innovations. It's uh, it's really great to see that happening. But there's also a top down process, and we need to kind of uh, uh, jingle with the with the two and uh, make them work with one another so that we get the best out of the two. And the top down process is better identifying what our needs are and uh, we often use this in uh, in, uh, eco- in the economic world uh, you you will hear about that uh, the donor the, the 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 big uh, the big guys which are saying hey you know if i'm hydro quebec that's what i need in electricity if i so on and so forth so so and the healthcare system needs to do that and help the innovators understand what the most important needs are so so uh, so that's that's where we're adding that's what we're trying to do and hopefully that uh, if you you need any kind of help and if you need any kind of uh, uh, people to uh, to uh, get into the uh, Ministry of Health or healthcare system with innovation, we are there to do that and to help you uh, do this uh, in a meaningful way. So we're looking for strategic contribution. We're looking for uh, for uh, spots where we, we can make an impact. Uh, I'm going to finish on just mentioning one one uh, word. Uh, there are two important uh, strategies that are being developed by the government, and both of them are under review right now. Il y a la stratégie québécoise de recherche et innovation, uh, so that's a that's a big one. The other one is the uh, life science uh, health uh, strategy. Those are tools that uh, we we are working with that are uh, allowing us to to get some financial support, some programs, some human resources to help uh, the uh, the research, fundamental research, uh, translational research, clinical research, and also all the innovation, and is are helping them to uh, to to support them and to uh, to create. Uh, uh, impact for the healthcare system, but also economic impact for the province. We we are currently involved in those uh, revision, and uh, we uh, we will continue to help find the best tools and the best ways so that we can help you. Thank you very much, Mr. Buko. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, and I appreciate your your support today. Next, we're going to hear from Mr. Noam Kranz. Uh, Mr. Kranz is Vice President of Venture Investments and J&J Innovation. With 20 years of experience in mergers, acquisitions, and investing in healthcare and technology, Noam is building a portfolio of best-in-class medical technologies investments to complement the strategic goals of the J&J medical devices sector. He has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the beautiful uh, University of California, Santa Barbara and a master's in business administration from Columbia Business School. He began his career in investment banking, specializing in technology and healthcare companies. He's held various business development roles at Inime Corporation, Mentor Corporation, and J&J. Noam, welcome. 
Uh, really, uh, thank you, thank you very much for for the nice introduction, and uh, couldn't be more thrilled to be here. I hope you all can hear me okay. I'm actually in my house that I just had renovated that's empty, so there's a little bit of an echo from my perspective. Um, so you know, it's it's uh, really nice for me to talk to you all. I, I grew up in Southern California, but I was born at the uh, Royal Victoria in Montreal. My parents' uh, mom went to undergrad and uh, did a master's program. Uh, I think in neuroscience and McGill and speech therapy. And my father has an accounting degree from, from, uh, from McGill as well, probably uh, from the from the fifties or sixties, if I remember correct. Uh, so McGill has a special place in my heart. Um, I've toyed with the idea of going to school there a few times, but it's just too cold uh, for, for my California blood these days. Um, so I come from Johnson & Johnson. I, I lead the West Coast Medical uh, Device Investing Group. We have a group called Johnson & Johnson Development Corp, which is a 50-some-odd-year-old uh, group that has a really good reputation for helping to seed innovation in the medical technology world. Uh, from a, a corporate venture capital perspective, we're probably the oldest uh, venture group of all corporations, let alone for healthcare, and regarded probably is the most successful, mostly from a reputational perspective, not a returns perspective. What we're looking to do is invest in great technologies at any, any stage and uh, help to bring them to, to, uh, to a level where we can acquire the companies or uh, in some cases where some other people decide to, other companies decide to acquire these, these technologies. Uh, so I thought a lot about what would be uh, interesting subjects to discuss with you all and and really kind of settled on three uh, key areas that, that are probably worth uh, thinking about from your all year's perspective, um, being early stage innovators. Um, the first really interesting thing to think about is that I think about three or four years ago, when I was sitting in New Jersey in my office, uh, in, uh, uh, when I ran business development, so our job was to acquire companies for the Ethicon business, of Johnson & Johnson, which is the oldest, uh, probably the oldest medical device company pretty much in the world. We started with sutures back in the 1880s um, and have grown into a portfolio of about $30 billion worth of different technologies. So we stepped back uh, a, a person who was pretty senior in the group and me and, and thought, well, what, what are the, what are the, the businesses that have for all the medical device portfolio at Johnson & Johnson, $30 billion, how many of them were acquired? What portion of that revenue was from acquired businesses, whether it be licenses of technologies, buying early stage. Um, and and uh, we, we went product by product for Ethicon. So sutures, all the different lines of sutures we have, all the different uh, surgical technologies we have, surgical tools, contact lenses, um, you know, uh, uh, AFib, uh, uh, ablation devices, or orthopedics line, hips, knees, all those businesses, what portion of it was from acquired technologies. And uh, interestingly, we could not find one that was not acquired. So literally the entire portfolio of technologies of Johnson Johnson medical devices we believe was acquired. It is possible there were some very early sutures technologies like cat cut sutures that weren't acquired, uh, but we couldn't quite pin down if those were the original technologies from the, the 1880s. Um, so, so literally uh, our dependence on innovation that's developed externally is close to 100%, which is an interesting figure to, uh, to think about. Um, and you can imagine that, that, that in, in buying these technologies, we make a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, a lot of venture capitalists, a lot of uh, physicians, a lot of PhDs that are developing technology in universities. Uh, we make a lot of them wealthy, uh, which is uh, sort of the fun part of the job. I am a little jealous because I don't have those capabilities. I can only buy them, uh, but uh, I only invest in them at this point. Um, so that's going back to my old role in business development where I was acquiring technologies. My new role, we do venture investing. We, we help uh, really put money into, into new technologies and sit back and watch them grow until the point where we hope to, to buy them. 
Um, the second interesting thing to think about is that if you went back prior to about 20 years ago and looked at the landscape of medicine, you would find that there were a lot of surgeons and physicians that had time to develop new technologies. So whether they were in private practice or working with universities, uh, a lot of our technology was purchased uh, in, in partnership with physicians. So we would license the technology from physicians that invented cool, to te cool new technology. The most obvious example would be the, uh, the Julio Palmas uh, uh, coronary uh, stent. Uh, that was a, a, a deal that we did, I believe, in the uh, early 90s. That uh, was the first time that they were putting hard metal actually into the uh, coronary arteries. And um, and that obviously worked and developed an amazing business. And that was actually a physician, actually owns a winery now in, in, uh, in Napa, a great winery if you ever want to visit, uh, uh, was a physician that developed this technology, radiologist actually, and brought it to us. And we uh, ended up purchasing it from him and another case where we made somebody wealthy. Um, so uh, in the last 20 years, what's happened is you've had a consolidation of uh, medical practices, consolidation of hospitals, consolidation of universities. And in order to deliver a more efficient level of care, uh, you've, you, you have physicians focused on their day jobs, which is really doing surgery, uh, providing for, for, for patients. And uh, their success really is about the care of the patient and their ability to do surgical procedures or, or handle patients not inventing new technologies. So a lot of that day-to-day -day work that 20 years ago in a group like Ethicon Business Development, they would be doing deals with physicians. They're now working with venture capitalists. They're working with, uh, we're, we're looking to buy technologies from entrepreneurs, people who often aren't physicians. Uh, what this does is really leaves a whole uh, gap in the community of, 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 uh, of entrepreneurship and innovation to people like yourselves that are at universities or in different programs uh, where they can spend the time to come up with new technologies, develop them, turn them into businesses or companies, and then sell them to us a little bit later. Um, so there is a, a one, a gap, the interesting new technology is being developed, and then two, the, the, how that gap has developed uh, really is because of this, I believe, because of this, 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 this phenomenon where physicians are developing a little bit less technologies day to day on their own in the regular practices. Um, and we are desperate for new technologies, desperate for, um, for, for innovators to uh, come up with new ideas that are uh, high growth, scalable. Um, and now you have a, a world where uh, there's digitization of technology, um, robotization, artificial intelligence, all of these areas are coming together that you're starting to see a whole new world of, of development in technology and innovation that we are looking to, to, to acquire. Um, it doesn't have to be purely clinically based like it did five, 10 years ago. It would be, okay, this product solves a clinical need that can be approved by the FDA and shows that it's better than another product, another procedure and therefore uh, has value and then you buy it nowadays, just being able to provide physicians a better view of the surgical space um, or be able to help them do their job better often is reimbursable and therefore from our perspective, a larger market. Uh, the third interesting uh, phenomenon, I'm probably running out of time here, but um, uh, just for you all to be cognizant of that I find interesting is that if you look across the world as countries are developing, um, they fall into different phases of innovation. And I imagine that some of you are uh, from Canada, probably some of you are from other regions or plan to practice in different regions. Something to be cognizant of is that if you look at the US and other uh, early Western Europe, Israel, parts of uh, Australia, South Africa, they're developing technologies based on patient needs. So they see, a, they see a need, they develop a procedure, they develop a technology, 
and they're able to turn that into a new technology that's then scalable and sellable to a company like us or or a company that they put in place themselves and, and actually develop uh, new companies. Um, as you go down the continuum to less developed, uh, you go to a place like China, for instance, where they're at this point a little bit more focused on, okay, we know this technology works, let's invent a similar technology or a little bit better technology in some cases. So they're a little bit more copy focused on technologies um, and uh, haven't yet moved to that stage where they're developing their own technologies based on their own needs. Um, we actually do have a fair amount of innovation that we try to do and try to kickstart those regions where we're trying to help develop technologies that are somewhat based on ours, but fit their landscapes a little bit better. And then as you go down from there, you have some, some areas where they're just looking to essentially provide healthcare as best they can and are interested in developing new technologies. So you have this continuum of care focused on, you know, best, in, you know, developing new procedures based on needs down to uh, trying to use what people have already invented to satisfy the needs of your customer, your, your patient base as a country. And then thirdly, down to these, these areas that are uh, really focused on gaining the, uh, the means to buy whatever technology is available. Um, so those are really the three interesting things that I thought were worth talking about. Um, again, really excited to be talking to you. I don't know if we have the capacity to take questions here or not, but um, I think that what you guys all do is very important and uh, uh, always really impressed with the quality of, of innovation that's been coming out of bio design type programs in the last few years. We're very active with Stanford and look forward to engaging with other uh, uh, platforms. Thank you, Noam, for those uh, for those insights and words of encouragement. It's uh, <clears throat> it's great to get your uh, your perspective on on innovation. Sad, sadly, I, I'm not sure we can take questions as uh, we're little, running a little bit behind schedule. But Already behind. Okay. Please stay. Please stay. To the um, now, I'd like to introduce uh, the last speaker uh, while the judges hopefully are, are drawing their deliberations to an end. For those of you who are wondering, you know, okay, this, this competition is nice, but what does it actually do? Then this talk is for you. Um, I'm pleased to present David uh, Benrimo, Chief Scientific Officer, AI Fred. As, as Chief Scientific Officer, he provides strategic direction and acts as a bridge between machine learning and the clinical team. He's also a psychiatry resident and researcher at McGill. He obtained his MD at McGill and his um, master's in neuroscience. Some of you may remember that the AI Fred team won a prize at our inaugural click event in 2018 when they were just a student team and they've continued to grow and prosper. Dr. Benrimo will now talk about how winning the prize has helped propel AI Fred forward. Welcome, David. Absolutely. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Barlett. Uh, and uh, there's so many people to thank, uh, yourselves, the Hakim family for, the, for putting the prize together. Uh, Miguel, um, Paul Larchevec, I want to thank him as well, uh, because uh, as I'll speak about, uh, the MSSS has been instrumental in helping uh, our recent development. Um, so uh, at the inaugural competition, we, we applied. We were a student team at that point putting our uh, business case together and getting our MVP uh, put together. And uh, the competition was quite central actually to some of our activities in, in the last few years. So we are a uh, software as a medical device company um, and we are addressing the need for improved treatment management and treatment selection in major depression. Um, major depression is the number one cause of disability around the world. It costs 210 billion in the US every year. Uh, 320 million people have it at any given time and one in nine people will experience it. So it's a fairly big deal. Um, and we are not very good at treating it. Uh, most patients don't get better after their first treatment. So what we did um, is we built a, an artificial intelligence powered clinical decision support system that sort of sits with the doctor and the patient and helps them work through not just the best practice guidelines, not just measurement-based care, so you're actually using objective measures to improve your, your quality of treatment, um, but also adds in a, an artificial intelligence-based personalization of the appropriate first-line pharmacotherapy to help improve the number of people who respond to their first treatment. 
Um, we applied with these ideas to the Click competition, um, and uh, we were at the same time going through a number of incubators. Uh, Stephen Arliss is here. Uh, we were at Centec, uh, and we had a lot of great support. Uh, we were D3, of course, as well. Um, and what was special about the Click competition was that it offered something um, at the end of it when we, when we had uh, won um, one of the prizes, which was uh, working at the simulation center. And working at the simulation center was really foundational for us because we were able to take our solution. We were able to test it with real doctors in a, in a simulated environment with the fantastic standardized patients at the sim center. And this was really helpful because our technology is not something that operates autonomously. It's not something that the patient just gets and they, they deal with it on their own. It's really meant to, to integrate into the existing patient physician relationship, which as all of the physicians and, and other healthcare professionals know here is a very touchy subject. So um, what we were able to do is we were able to actually watch how doctors use this new kind of tool, which none of them have ever used before because this is a new kind of system that the FDA and Health Canada both had a difficult time sort of getting their heads around. Um, and uh, that was wonderful. Not only did we publish papers uh, based off of that, which made the academics among us very happy. Uh, we have a second one that we've recently submitted for publication as well and got a poster out of it, but it taught us a lot. It taught us about how physicians will interact with the system, how they're gonna talk about it, how often they'll actually agree with it, um, what drives that agreement. So we found, for example, that the severity of the patient, i.e. how much they feel they need help treating the patient and their trust in the system predict how often they agree with it. And that the trust in the system, which is the only modifiable factor here because patients are as sick as they come in, um, the trust in the system was we could predict that based off of certain uh, elements of how data was presented in our application. Um, and that was really helpful because it guided our development and it guided how we built our tool out going forward. It served as a key set of proof points during our first and second investment rounds. And it was very, very important, again, as a proof point in um, uh, putting together our reports for the IBM Watson AI X prize competition, which is a uh, $3 million first prize global competition of which we're now one of the finalist teams. Um, and that's gonna be decided next month. So all of you keep your fingers crossed for us. We'd like to win the big prize. Um, and a lot of this really came from being able to do that foundational work at the Sim Center, because the one question in everybody's mind when you tell them that you're gonna give doctors AI is not how good is the AI, it's not how good is how well good are your predictions, it's not even what data set that you use, is are doctors actually gonna use it? Are you gonna scare people? Are you gonna scare patients? Um, and how do you know that this is gonna go anywhere? And we were able to demonstrate that physicians actually, you know, you can watch them session to session to session, and they were getting better at it. They were getting more comfortable with it. Within a short amount of time, even a psychiatrist uh, in 10 minutes was able to put the system together and, and, and use it uh, to inform their conversations with the patient. And we usually spend an hour with patients. So we were able to sort of get our stuff together and move forward. Um, and that was really great because then that led to us having enough information to run our first, uh, our first in man study, as, as, as Stephen Arliss would say, um, our first study with actual humans, which we completed uh, early, uh, uh, sorry, late uh, 2020, um, where we were able to demonstrate in real clinic with real patients and real physicians, the first time this kind of system has been implemented ever, as far as we know, in mental health, um, that it was, it was feasible and usable for both physicians and patients. Um, it wasn't an effectiveness study, it was just a feasibility trial. So I can't tell you about effectiveness, but it was, we were able to show that people could use it. It didn't make session lengths horribly long and it was something that people could use. And again, we cut our teeth and learned how to train physicians at the Sim Center, which was a result of the Click Prize. So really this, this prize meant a lot to us in our development. And then um, moving forward, what we learned from our feasibility study let us run our largest project to date, which was a quality improvement project based on uh, the measurement-based care and algorithm-guided treatment part of our application, where we worked with uh, 34 patients, 17 physicians at four CLSEs and GMFs in a project that was responding to the COVID pandemic uh, that was supported by the M3S and by the MedTech um, uh, consor consortium. Um, and in that project, we were actually able to show, compared to a control group, that patients who used our system alongside their physicians 
had significantly improved outcomes compared to those who didn't. So we were seeing a 50% decrease in depression symptoms at, at, at project end, which is actually consistent with the literature on measurement-based care. The problem is usually measurement-based care is applied in a, in, a, in a clinical trial setting with lots of support and people watching you to make sure you're doing things properly. This was much less uh, um, uh, structured than that. It was a quality improvement project. We mostly just gave doctors the app to see if they could use it and they could and patients got better. Uh, and that was, again, to help uh, respond to the need to move to telemedicine during the pandemic. And we saw that physicians actually and patients really appreciated having access to that in telemedicine during the pandemic. Um, so really, you know, the, the work of a startup, the work of bringing this kind of tool into the clinical world where you're actually treating patients and helping people, uh, you're running Health Canada approved studies and all this is about getting the right um, the right fit with your users and the right fit with your market. Um, and the right fit with our users, a lot of that came from being able to, uh, not just the notoriety that came from winning click, but being able to work at the SIM center and everything that came from that. So um, I, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I just wanna say that it's been, a, it's been a really fantastic journey. We've learned so much from working closely with physicians and patients. Um, and, uh, oh, I see the judges coming back, so that's time. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I want to thank everybody here again for the wonderful opportunities that were provided to us and, uh, keep your fingers crossed for us for the X prize and for our clinical trial, that's going to be starting, uh, probably, uh, end of the summer, early in the fall. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Benrimo. That was really interesting to hear about all the great things that's been going on for AFRID Health. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago that we were celebrating the the first uh, click, and here we are already at the at the fourth. So very exciting. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're just calling all of the judges back into the room, uh, and then we'll be able to um, to share the exciting news with you. So just bear with us for a minute or two while we do that. Thank you. From having been in the judging room, it's it's half half an hour just seems like two seconds, right? So. Um... We're still getting uh, uh, some heated discussion uh, about some of the positions here. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, I'm just going to take a call and, and clarify this, and then I'll be able to introduce the um, the lead judge to you. So our judges are back, and um, I'd like to introduce uh, Robin Tamlin our head judge to you. She is Professor of Medicine, Distinguished James McGill Chair, and Scientific Director of the McGill Clinical and Health Informatics Research Group. She's also Co-Director of Digital Health at McGill. She's a member of the Order of Canada and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She's now just going to uh, tell you a little bit about the judging process and, and why, <laughs> why that was so fraught. Uh, Robin, are you, are you ready? So thank you so much, Jake. Uh, I've got to say it was a con considerable pleasure to be um, able to participate in, uh, in this discussion that we had amongst the judges. We have many different perspectives. Uh, it goes to say how, how uh, successful I think the competition has been up to this point that you have really innovative solutions that we had to make decisions about. Uh, and it wasn't easy. And I don't think that we... I would say we're unanimous in any way about, about who was first, second, and third here. But I think everyone recognized that this was, um, uh, we came to, at this with different perspectives as to whether it was innovative, if it targeted an important problem, and so on. And, uh, and I think that we've come up with something that we can all live with. And I do congratulate all of the finalists because you guys made it tough for us to deliberate and you can tell how long it took us to, to get there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. So let's let's get on with awarding the prizes. First, we'll be awarding the Marika Zelenka Roy Innovation Prize offered in partnership with the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. First, we'd like to extend warm greetings to Mrs. Uh, Roy who is in the audience with us tonight, as well as Jean-Guy Gordeau, President of the, and CEO of the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. Mrs. Roy was a pioneer. She was one of the first female students to graduate from electrical engineering at McGill. And as an engineer, she's a firm believer in the importance of collaboration between disciplines and the need to foster innovation. 
Her generous support of this surprise supports a belief that clinical innovation provides a great opportunity for professionals and students from different backgrounds to work together. Health sciences, business and engineering can utilize the expertise and viewpoints of each other to generate new ideas. Thank you so much, Mrs. Roy, and hope to see you at, at the next uh, competition in person. So, uh, without further ado, the second place winner is Neuromedical. Neuro, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, on behalf of the whole team, thank you to, to, to Ms. Roy and, and the whole organizing community. This has been uh, this would be great for us to be part of this with so many great innovative companies. Uh, it's an honor. So thank you, everyone. Congratulations. And the first place winner is Remote Optical. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of my team, I'd like to thank Marika Zelenka Roy all the um, organizers of the Click competition, thank you for giving us the platform to pitch our solution and all our competitors, um, you did a great job. And so it was an honor to pitch alongside you as well as Andrew Churchill, thank you for your pitch help. Congratulations. <clears throat> so now we will be awarding the final prize of the evening, the Hakim Family Innovation Prize. We're very pleased that uh, Dr. Hakim's brother, Antoine Hakim, is also present with us today. Antoine is a well-known uh, neurologist who worked at the Neuro for over 20 years. He's now Chief of Neu Neurology and Director of Neuroscience at Ottawa General Hospital. Welcome. And <clears throat> the winner is X McHugh. Wow, thank you so much. I'm speechless and I um, just want to uh, say thank you to the team. Charlie Bouchard, patient partner uh, who led this initiative and really changed the way that I thought about medicine in my own practice and helped me to realize that we were undergoing a very rapid revolution in healthcare. Um, to Valerie Jack, who has made this happen through her project management and to Gaurav Isola and Priya Patel, who have been on the technical side, helping us through and the cloud ops are a cloud-based um, solution for hosting. I'm just incredibly grateful as well to Valetti, um, who is the development shop for us, um, who've been a, an incredible partner to be able to iterate with. And thank you to your team um, and Dr. Hakeem for this opportunity. We are just uh, very, very grateful and looking forward to learning more. That's wonderful. Congratulations then to all of the winners this evening and even the people that made it to the final. That was a huge achievement. I think we can all agree the uh, the quality and strength of the uh, of the teams this year has been fantastic. As you see, it's made it extremely difficult to uh, to pick winners. And uh, thanks to the judges again for uh, doing such a great job and was a very difficult task. So in addition to the cash prizes and universe, access to university membership and services, the winning teams will have the option to apply for matching funds. They'll receive um, services and support courtesy of our partners. I believe those of you on YouTube will now see the slide. So this includes a, a dedicated physical presence at the uh, new clinical innovation platform at the Montreal General Hospital, McGill's first kind of medtech incubator space. They would also have an opportunity to participate in um, a brand new initiative from um, Dobson, the Dobson Center. This is the Dobson Health Sciences Lean Startup Program. This is a special um, business coaching program specifically for medical technologies at McGill University. And I'd like to thank uh, Mary J, <clears throat> Mary Jose uh, Lamothe for, um, and her team for putting this program together to support the winners. We're also pleased to be able to provide strategy and product development uh, consultancy with uh, Canada's leading medical device design company, Novo, who provide um, support for all of the winners. And finally, uh, we'd like to acknowledge Faskin for providing their startup program to all of the teams in the final today. 
So thank you again on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science here. I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for attending and encouraging our teams this evening. Merci d'avoir participé à cet événement spécial de Bicentaire qui célèbre l'innovation de la soin de la de santé à McGill. So we hope to see you all next year at the uh, 22, 2022 Click event, hopefully in person. Stay safe, be healthy, have a great evening, and congratulations again to all of the teams.